All right. So uh, hopefully I'm going to get uh, the screen. Uh, cool. All right, cool. Hey, everyone. So uh, thank you for inviting me. It's my first time in Switzerland. Uh, it's a beautiful country. And today we're going to speak about uh, security. So it's a serious topic. Please don't smile, don't laugh. Stay serious. OK. All right, cool. So uh, my name is Liran Tal. I came here from Israel. Uh, it's, a, it's a long trip, uh, but worth it. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Sneak, which is a company that builds open source and developer friendly tooling to help you secure your apps, find vulnerabilities, monitor them, and you know, fix them. Uh, besides that, I'm also working, uh, uh, volunteering, let's say, uh, at the Node Foundation, the security working group. Uh, I'm doing some volunteering work around uh, OWASP projects, uh, mainly Node, uh, Node Goat, which we'll, we might be using today as well as uh, deliberately. Uh, a vulnerable project web app to, for education purposes. Uh, I've authored a book called Essential Node.js Security, so I've kind of been around uh, the Node.js JavaScript uh, security scene for a while. Um, so we're going to talk about Node.js today, and Node.js is you know, uh, known to be based on JavaScript as a runtime, and JavaScript is everywhere. We're seeing it around um, chatbots, IoT, uh, maybe, uh, maybe some robotics if you've known uh, something like Johnny5 as a JavaScript framework to, to handle Arduino and stuff like that. Uh, machine learning, TensorJS flow, making it to the browser, to the, to the, to the node runtime server side. Um, databases as well, right? MongoDB, you can write kind of stored procedures calls uh, based on JavaScript languages. So uh, very affiliated with the JavaScript and the node ecosystem is obviously the NPM registry, which is uh, a largely based uh, open source packages uh, for the JavaScript ecosystems, and it's been growing massively, right? This is where developers and maintainers kind of meet. It is having almost, I think, one million of packages served in that repository, over 40 billion downloads a month, right? So open source is exploding, everyone using JavaScript. If you're using a .NET, a Java, anything like that on the back end, you're still probably using JavaScript somewhere in the front end to kind of uh, roll things around. So today we're going to dive a little bit deeper into what I call black clouds and silver linings in Node.js security. And that is, we're going to talk about um, some scary state, uh, some, some horror stories maybe of the scary state of Node.js and JavaScript security as well. Uh, we're going to learn and do some live hacking for some exploitation. Uh, hopefully, the internet will be uh, friendly to me. And lastly, I'm going to show something I call silver lining, which is kind of all the happy stories and how things are going to hopefully be better uh, using a lot of uh, tools and, and knowledge that we're going to share here. So let's start, just jump into it, malicious modules on NPM. I'm pretty sure uh, some of you have heard about some of them. Let's, let's go and walk through uh, the history of what happened there. So January 2015, uh, this is kind of, uh, I, I start from this place, and Rimraf all, has anyone heard about this uh, package? Yes, a few of you, great. It's, it's a great package, I really recommend it. Um, let me show you how it looks like the package JSON. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more to show you what happens when you install it. Yes, so if you want to wipe your hard drive, go ahead and install it. It's not gonna ask you, do you want to kindly wipe your hard drive, do you wanna run these install scripts? No, it's gonna do it as part of the installation process. So that made it there. Someone found out about it on Twitter back then, then NPM found out about it too, they removed it, etc. but maybe it affected some people. Moving on, August 2017, um, CrossEnv is published to NPM, it's, it's a malicious package, but let's talk a little bit about, about what CrossEnv really is. So there is a package called Cross-Env, which is uh, kind of a utility made by a, a fairly popular and known person in the, uh, in the uh, uh, JavaScript community. Um, Ken C. Dodds, he created this utility to help you manage your environment variables, things like secrets and stuff like that. Um, very very uh, useful tool. And when I wanted to install it, you know, I could go and do npm install cross and, you know, and save it to my package, to my package uh, JSON manifest. Uh, the only thing is, Cross-env is not cross-env, right? And that's a fairly easy mistake to make. And more than that, uh, you could understand that maybe someone who would want to trick you into doing this would maybe put it on Hacker News or some other Stack Overflow and kind of maybe trick you into doing it. This is kind of thing called typo-squatting attacks, 
which we've seen of you know quite a few of them, and this made it uh, like this is a real package that was maliciously sent there, and again this time again uh, only someone from the community tweeted about it, and this is how it became known. But had someone not uh, not seen it, you know, s people might have actually installed it, um, you know, not deliberately by by mistake. And what it did is something you know very very um, innocent. It just stole all of your environment variables when you installed it and sent it to a remote server, and in the, in the meanwhile, it also wrapped the original cross env library. So if you actually used it, you didn't know that you were affected by it. You would get all the same functionality. So great stuff. Oh, Slack screen. Good. All right, cool. So, um, so again, uh, moving on to 2018. Uh, several stories, I'm pretty sure you heard of, uh, you, you've heard of some of them. Uh, one of them is get cookies which is a backdoor package that was put into uh, uh, another library called Mail Parser, which only gets downloaded like 300,000 a month. Okay, that's the fairly low number, uh, talking in NPM numbers, but that's still a very uh, large amount of people that could have been compromised by this uh, backdoor that allowed them, uh, whoever the malicious attacker was, to have a remote command and control uh, system into anyone who wouldn't have, would have installed it. Um, the other story we've heard about is in 2018, ESLint Scope, which is another malicious package that would have stalled all of your .NPM or C files, which basically just have your tokens. So if you're a, ma you're a maintainer and you have tokens installed on NPM uh, and on, on your NPM or C, which everyone basically has, uh, it would have stolen, the, stolen them and sent them to a remote attacker so he could get and compromise more accounts. So these, are, these two are kind of unique. They are a different kind of malicious packages attack on the registry, and they focus on compromising um, credentials by people, right, by maintainers that actually own them so they can publish something malicious uh, instead, of the, uh, instead of the real one. I'm pretty sure you've heard about this one. EventStream has really made it into so many headlines, and I can probably go on a full talk just to talk about this one, but this is a different case from what we've seen before. This is not uh, account compromise, and this is not typo squatting attack. This is a really good crafted social engineering attack targeting uh, Bitcoin developers, uh, Bitcoin app developers uh, specifically, uh, with the ability to kind of steal your, your Bitcoins and made it there. Uh, the thing is, it also went unnoticed for almost two months. Right, this, is, this is kind of outrageous that this has been there targeting some specific developers in order to steal Bitcoins and has been there for like two months until someone uh, raised an issue on the, on the Nodemon issue queue and said, you know, I'm looking at something weird where I'm installing a package. What's going on? And this is kind of how it blew up. But no one had thought about it before. So these are all kinds of, um, of vulnerabilities that affect us as developers so we're talking about contributors, and you know, it's nice to think about open source contributors, everyone are doing it uh, voluntarily, or maybe most of us, uh, but the thing is, what if I told you that contributors, those maintainers that actually create packages, could be compromised? I'm gonna share with you a research that has been, been doing, um, been going for I think two years already, uh, for a researcher that actually, a security researcher that works um, voluntarily as well, with the security uh, foundation, with, sorry, with the Node Foundation Security Working Group. Uh, he is on the technical steering committee. He's uh, working with the NPM community as well to alert them of these issues. And what he found is that he was able to get published access to 14% of those NPM packages. What that accounts to is 20% of the total downloads of NPM as well. That's pretty outrageous as well. How does it happen? Have you heard about Express, React? debug. Any of those? Raise your hand. He basically managed to get publish access to all of them. For some of them, he managed to get those publish, uh, those, uh, publish access several times. So it's shocking, I know. This is kind of how I felt as well when I, when I read this research. And uh, we're, we're doing some work together, so it's pretty interesting to see how this all folds. So basically, this is some of the research insights, right? 600 developers had their password set to 123456. Incredible. If you've just been to the other uh, talk, the quick one uh, 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 from a guy from Out Zero about forgetting your passwords, this is why you should uh, maybe use just uh, stronger passwords and more uh, means of authentication. We're going to talk about it. Also, 100,000, uh, sorry, 1,000 uh, or almost 1,500 of them had their password set to their username, which is confusing. 
hard to guess, but that also happened. And 11% of them used or reused a password that they already had on a different site. And with all those data breaches going on, we have those passwords. That's why it's important not to use them again. Use a password manager, use something else, just do not reuse passwords. Now get all of this into context. This is compromising maintainers' accounts, people that we actually use their code, their libraries, their de these dependencies in our projects, and we take it for granted. But we have no idea what kind of you know, security knowledge, security practices, um, anything else around uh, how these uh, maintainers and developers treat security in their apps. So dependency management I is kind of hard on no at, in Node. Uh, I don't know how many people here are you know, Node and JavaScript pure developers, but um, th the ecosystem is very convoluted. There are many dependencies. One is direct, you know, is dependent on the other. There is a really, uh, you know, any kind of a tree actually looks a bit more like a graph, right? It's, it's, a, it's a dependency and then another dependency and another, another dependency, all kind of related, bubble up together. So it's very hard to manage all of this. OWASP, which is the uh, Open Web Application Security Project, has uh, this thing called OWASP Top 10, which is web application security risk that it rates every several years. And one of them that has been breaking the internet, as I dub it, since 2013, uh, obviously it went back uh, before that, uh, but it has, it's called you know, using components with known vulnerabilities. So people actually you know, use that. Companies, developers, we, we use those components and they have known vulnerabilities. Are we doing something to scan, to figure out, to find out uh, what are we building and shipping our app with? So if there's anything you're going to take from this talk, please take this one. That's a slide that shows you, as a developer, you're deploying an app, shipping it somewhere, containerizing it, whatever you're doing with that, shipping it somewhere. That's kind of what you think when you're doing something. Except this is the obviously truth about it. This is the obvious truth, the harsh truth. We're actually reusing a lot of open source components. Our code is very minimal, and that's okay, right? Open source is awesome. We want to reuse what other people are building. That's great. But the fact of the matter is, when you're deploying your app, you're deploying other people's codes, right? Strangers. You do not know them. You have no idea how maintainers, developers are building their stuff, what is their security knowledge, and what actions have they took to, to, you know, to protect against it. So who watches after all of these modules, after all of these security vulnerabilities? Let's take a case that I'm pretty sure you've heard of, Equifax. It's a company that has been uh, doing data analytics and been uh, notoriously known for uh, its data breach in 2017. I'm picking that one because it's, it's usually had made it to a lot of headlines and people understand uh, the context. So what happened there is there is a, vulnerab there is, um, um, and a component called Apache Struts, which is a web application framework for Java that had, uh, around March, uh, this uh, responsible disclosure for security vulnerability. One day after that, as you can see, there's already been a fixed as well as a proof of concept, a Python script that actually exploits this vulnerability. The thing is, this entire, f entire uh, catastrophe could have been prevented because for almost two or three months, a known vulnerability with a fix has not been attended to. Right? If they had only fixed that, if they had only upgraded, if they had only tracked their dependencies, things would have looked different. But they haven't, and that's why they got hacked. So let's talk about education, right? We're all reading blogs, writing blogs, content, etc., podcasts, whatever you want, conferences. So I've, I've, this is a personal story. I've been uh, reading uh, this from a couple of years ago. I've seen a blog called, you know, how to build Wi-Fi dashboards with Node.js and Reactive.js. Sounds completely interesting. I went in and started reading it, and very, very quickly, I found out something that I, feel, I felt really bad about when I was reading it. I noticed that it uses child process.exec. And while you're thinking, well, maybe it's coming from some constant, hard-coded, you have no idea what's going on there, and I understand that sometimes you need to you know, spawn system processes, but using this specific API is very, very dangerous. If you actually go to the node docs, they will tell you, never pass unsanitized user input to this function. Am I overreacting? Let's see. This is a package called MAC address. This, this is uh, a vulnerability uh, disclosure report that we've, that we've done, uh, we've actually like triaged in the Node uh, security working group. I triaged it, um, and as you can see, it's a command injection for a package called MAC address that for some reason needs to execute and run commands. How many times it gets downloaded? Almost 10 million times a month. All right, so 
kind of scary state of horror stories in Node.js security. Let's go and try and, and see some exploits. So I'm going to show you some kind of a uh, command injection that I found in a tool uh, that I've been working on. So let me just mirror my screen so we can see it. All right, cool. There we go. So there's a really cool tool. It's called uh, Pull It. Let me show you the. Uh, it, it, it that's not mine. It's this one um, used by you know created by someone else. Uh, what it does is something really cool. I'm a very uh, uh, enthusiastic uh, user of command line apps. So when you want to merge uh, or you know check pull requests that other people are opening to your repository, sometimes you need to uh, you know move to, you know, check out their branch, uh, see if it works, maybe add some uh, some fixes and work on it. So. I have it here for my own fork of that. Um, oh, there we go. Very interesting. <laughs> okay, good thing I have a live demo for that. All right, so as you can see on the top screen, I'm checking out a repository, uh, or checking out a branch called uh, semicolon echo hello world slash temp slash a. What, does, what that does is actually checking out a, uh, a branch that has a very valid name in terms of you know, GitHub and Git specifically. So uh, in, in reality, what it is, is it's, ex it's terminating some command and executing a different one. So as you can see from the video, I'm actually going to uh, commit, uh, you know, call it safe commit. I'm just going to commit and, and, and push this branch uh, somewhere else. Uh, you can see from the command line the exact uh, branch name that is actually malicious. I'm going to create a file called slash temp slash a. As a user, I would go and, you know, create a pull request out of this. So I would go to the repository, open GitHub, you know, fill in any information that I would need to uh, from the title, the description, and um, here I'm just updating it to use uh, not my fork, uh, but uh, sorry, not the original one, but my fork, and I'm going to open it. And at this point in time, maybe a developer would want to check out, you know, well, what is this uh, pull request is doing? Maybe I need to rerun it, fix some tests, uh, make it work. As you can see again on the on the screenshot or the video here, the branch name, which is kind of malicious, a way of creating a bash command to create or uh, in insert content into slash temp slash a file is very much valid, right? There's no, there's no punctuation um, issues with that. So what, I, what I'm going to show here is that after I'm using uh, pull it over here, so first of all, of course, showing of course that uh, this file doesn't exist. Running pull it, showing that, you know, trying to hit uh, this safe commit, the pull request that I just opened works just fine. Uh, if I run it, um, I actually move to uh, a different branch maybe. Um, and when I uh, you know, view what is in slash temp A, it's the exact hello world that I opened. Why does this happen? Well, it happens because the code itself is using something that is uh, a, a dangerous API. So if we go back into, are you still seeing the idea? Okay. So that's not readable, I can zoom in a little bit more. Uh, but as you can see, this is the source code for Pullit, and it's running exec sync and you know, git fetch, whatever. As it's getting the branch name here, I'm going to stop it, go on a semicolon, end this command, and do something else. And this is the problem with education. We need to write good code, because most of the time, people are going to go there and you know, copy-paste what we wrote. And if we have neglected it or hadn't put some kind of disclosure saying, you know, I wrote it uh, using exec for brevity or something like that in, in, my, in my blog, people are, might be able to copy this uh, as a learning experience and use it. So best practice is try to use exec file. Um, which is more specific, you're able to provide the arguments as an array and not something uh, as an entire string that may originate, as you've seen here, through GitHub as a medium of exploiting this uh, problem uh, remotely and entirely remotely um, uh, and spawning shell commands. Uh, the other thing is you can try and maintain a whitelist uh, of allowed arguments. Last thing is, you know, blacklist. If you need, if you're not doing whitelist, at least blacklist it with some special characters. Not very recommended, but if you have to. And at the very last thing, Pray because spawning system processes in general is not going to be safe. So another example of 
trying and, and seeing what kind of vulnerabilities you can have in your app. Let's talk about NoSQL injections. So NoSQL injections, um, ha have anyone heard about SQL injections? Great. But what are NoSQL injections? Because you can't concatenate strings. Right? You're not working with strings as your uh, basic structure, your basic type. It's, it's not looking like that. It's, it's looking a little bit more like this. What can you concatenate exactly? User is, you know, is, is a language construct. It's an object, array, whatever. It's something else. It's not something you can concatenate to. So let's see what happens when we do that. Okay, making sure you guys are seeing the same thing. Cool. So um, here is my app. Here is my app. This is the Node Goat app. Uh, I'm going to log in as admin just so you can see it. it it's live. It's working. I'm running it from localhost. Um, and let's use Postman to send a login request. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more so you can see it. But basically, I'm sending a post request into slash API slash login. I'm going to send um, In the body, I'm going to send username admin, password admin. It's, ex it's JSON, so it's expecting an object. And as I send this request in, let me show you this. It is telling me that I need to log in, right? Invalid username, username, password, etc. I didn't log in because that's the incorrect password. Except if I use, just to show you the correct password, which is admin, and then admin123, this is the correct one, and I'll send it. You can see that I'm already logged in. There's a logout button. There's benefits, etc. The app itself, right? So this is this is okay. What happens if I try to NoSQL inject it, right? I'm gonna try and hack my way through. But how am I gonna do that? I'm gonna send something that is is causing you know a missing um, a, a missing loop inside what, what inside the entire uh, way of how the app handles this. What I mean is I'm gonna send as a username and password another object. What happens is that every Express Web application that you've seen probably has this classic, let's use body parser that JSON, let's use uh, app use, you know, that body, par uh, body parser that uh, URL encoding, et cetera. And it, it, it needs those things because Express by itself, for example, isn't able uh, built in to parse uh, JSON uh, requests. So it, it, it's okay, it's like a small core, and then it's offloading this to other modules, which every 90% of all Express apps you'll see, they have this app use body parser. Um, so what happens over here is that I'm doing um, uh, a MongoDB query that says, you know, if it's greater than nothing, which obviously will return everything, uh, it's the same for the password. And if I use that, let's see what happens. Is this not working? All right, let's debug live. So here in my code, I have the validate API login. Um, as you can see, I'm using uh, username, password, um, and right. And I'm, I'm actually in this AP handle API login request. I'm actually calling uh, another callback called API login, which as I'm using, let's see what's going on. Uses uh, username and password. Let's see if I just need to rebuild my npm app. Not this one. There we go. All right. So let's see if this works. All right. So username and password, and now I'm logged in. Now, why did this happen? Because before, what I had in my code is a way to mitigate the problem. And as you can see, NoSQL injection worked in this case. But what did I have before the demo to show that uh, this was mitigated? So as I said before, the thing is we are calling a callback uh, that gets username and password from the request object, right? That's just very basic express usage or uh, any other web application from that you would use, happy or whatever. You would get request.body.username. The thing is, at this point, username is already an object because we're using body parser you know, uh, to JSON, and, and it's already making it an object. So when I'm doing username, uh, username here in cups, that means I'm actually giving uh, the defined one, which is a MongoDB API, a query to run, uh, and, this, and the object gets here. So actually what I had before here is something like this, right? That's a way to overcome it, or at least mitigate uh, 
the vulnerability in a very easy way. Uh, not saying that this is how you should fix it, uh, but just to kind of convey the point where we may get uh, unexpected data as developers. We're not really understanding the entire attack coverage and, and threat modeling around our app. So we might be able, you know, if we are maybe strongly typed or at least doing some kind of checks before that, uh, you would see that this mitigates the problem. I'm gonna restart uh, the node goat app again. It doesn't have an auto restart thing, so we're gonna restart it. And if I send it again, we'll see it like before that it's um, telling me that I need to, right, invalid username and password. Right, so it's a b very basic mitigation point. Uh, but if you scan, for example, GitHub for projects that have, you know, uh, find one username, password, just like that, plain one, you would see it, you know, a whole lot of them. And that's one of the problem of understanding how things work. And, in, uh, and this is like a simple NoSQL injections. There are much, much, uh, you know, more advanced ways of doing this. So. Um, What's, what's the best practice here? So as we said, validate input, uh, validate uh, length and type, which is important on the node runtime specifically. Uh, of course, use parameters binding um, if you're using something like, uh, like you know, like SQL injections as uh, SQL for SQL injections as well. Um, and I want to move on to something else that I'm actually more passionate about, and that is Redos. Has anyone heard about this term? Okay, how about regular expression denial of service? It's a very common term, and it's real good. It's a very common term on a node, uh, because node uh, both the core uh, runtime as well as NPM libraries uh, for node on NPM has been found uh, at an increasingly uh, a rate uh, vulnerable to regular expression denial of service attack. Now let me ask you, who likes writing uh, regular expressions, or who at least wrote it in the past? We've all wrote regular expressions in the past. Who likes writing it? No one. S two people, two people, probably Perl developers. Who likes reading regular expressions? Who had read this uh, paper by the University of, Bur uh, uh, of uh, I think, Brigham, uh, UK, uh, about um, uh, regular expression denial of services? No one, right? We, are, we do not have this knowledge. And it's kind of like magic to us. We kind of try something, and if it works, we maybe push it to production, etc. There's not a lot of science that we're putting into, uh, into uh, uh, writing regular expressions, except those two Perl uh, developers were obviously masters of it. So let me, I'm gonna give you one second to figure out what this is. Right, no one likes regular expressions. Okay, I'm gonna make it uh, quicker. It's an IP address. It's, it's not very readable, but that's what it is. And when you write it and you ship it to production, you're like, oh man, high five, it works, right? The product manager, whatever, business, Chrome, uh, story, whatever, wanted me to, uh, uh, you know, uh, regex an IP address, make sure that it's valid, etc. and I used it and it works, I tested it, it looks fine, let's push it to production. So I'm gonna play a little uh, game with you to write regular expressions and see what happens and how that can really go uh, bad. So let's try matching a song title, and I picked something that's gonna be uh, very easy for us to match, so you don't have to uh, put a lot of science into it. Uh, let me zoom in a bit more. So let's, let's try matching a song, right? Song has letters, maybe lowercase, maybe uppercase, maybe it has a number. So I'm gonna start it. Um, feel free to talk uh, and suggest uh, as we go. So I'm gonna, had, uh, I'm gonna start and end it uh, with something. I know I'm gonna have a capturing group, um, and I'm gonna need to match something like A to Z, uh, maybe maybe A to Z like this, maybe zero to nine like that. Um, song name, anyone? Song name, anyone? Stairway to heaven, okay. It didn't match because we have a space, right? And we also need to repeat uh, this pattern as well. So let's add a space. Let's, let's type something simple. Space here works, right? Um, if we had something else like stairway to heaven, it doesn't match because we need to um, repeat the capturing group several times. Uh, and maybe also it doesn't have a space, it doesn't end with a space, we don't really know uh, if there's a space in the end or we don't want to allow it. So something like this. Um, and just to make that uh, a repeating pattern, we'll try something like that. So all of the pattern is being matched. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a, a little bit of a, of an advanced developer and try to do several stuff. I'm gonna do stairway to heaven, match is fine. What if someone sends me a really, 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 really long string? Looks fine, right? 
Ready to push to production, right? Yes. All right, what happens if I do something else? I kind of give it maybe a, a long string, um, and then I put something that it didn't ex ex uh, expect, maybe something like an exclamation mark. Now, I'm naturally not a front-end developer, but every time I see something red, I know it's bad, right? So what's, what we're seeing going on here is a catastrophic backtracking. This is something that is uh, very, um, uh, very much related to the regex engine underlying, right? So in general, our regular expressions uh, are being evaluated using uh, those engines. And there's different kind of engines. There's like uh, 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 an undeterministic finite automata, a deterministic finite automata. It depends on the language. It depends on many things of how uh, like the runtime and everything around it is built. Um, so for JavaScript, uh, uh, the engine uses a uh, technology or a mechanism called backtracking, which is basically what it tries to do is, as I'm giving it this string, it says, well, let's see if I can match uh, a stairway to having you know, this greedy thing with, with some of the patterns. So as it's able to go through all of it, that's fine. But as I give it something it's not able to match, it's, it's going to go and backtrack one step and now going to try and, you know, and use this to match everything and then this to match everything, and then this to match everything as much as it can throughout all the tokens. So if I show you what happens with the regex debugger, great. So what happens behind the scene as we can walk through it, and this is what I told you, it's trying to match this pattern with uh, some of the string and more and more and more and more. And as it goes to the end, it tries to match an exclamation mark. It has nothing to, to match it, so it backtracks one, uh, one of the pattern tokens and tries to match the, uh, the rest of it. And it goes and does this in a f in because this regex is written in a very, uh, uh, in a not very good way, right? Not a very optimized way. There are different ways of making this uh, pattern actually work, but this is a really bad way of writing it. And we may make those mistakes and get uh, the engine to run something like a million steps to try and, and figure out, right? It needs to, it's like a state machine, right? It needs to go through some states and, and finish at the end. And it's unable to finish it. So the browser here is stopping and, you know, stopping that loop and, and, and saying, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and, and go through all these infinite steps because it's going to take me infinite time. Um, what happens is when you take that, uh, that kind of, uh, of vulnerability and apply it to something like Node.js. Node is, as everyone is familiar with, is very uh, single-threaded and has some uh, backing threads uh, in the back of it uh, using many abstractions to kind of do all the I.O. works. Except regular expression is not really I.O., it's CPU. It's just like trying to iterate you know, 10 million, 10 billion uh, array elements and trying to, to, f to do something with that. So as you do that, you're blocking the CPU, blocking something else. So let's see what happens when you do that for a node. I'm going to time it um, the exact same uh, regular expression we tried. I'm going to use uh, the famous uh, Britney Spears songs here because I'm a, I'm a huge fan. And I'm going to show you what happens. Great, that, that continued uh, really fast. And as I add more strings to it, that also works pretty fast. Uh, but the moment I add something that the regex engine is not expecting, it's going to go and backtrack. And at the moment, what it's, what's really happening is that my CPU, let me enlarge that for you. My CPU is working really hard to get this result. It's already finished. Let me show you. If you look to the right, you will see the CPU for node is running at 100% at one time. And the, the longer the string that I'm going to add here is the more, ex the more exponential time that it's going to take my CPU to figure out and work out this regular expression. The, more, the most scary part out of this problem is that you may have, uh, you know, you may use some kind of regular expression behind the scene from other libraries that, you know, you didn't write them, but they are vulnerable for it with very specific input. So I'm going to stop. Uh, you've seen that 100 CPU thing. And when that happens, of course, uh, Node is not going to process anything. All the requests are just going to stop and halt at that point. Uh, your CPU is going to jump. And that's what's going to happen. So a catastrophic backtracking around regular expressions. Um, and it exploiting the idea that we're trying to uh, give it grandy quantifiers, like a plus and then a plus, and uh, maybe a matching group uh, with a plus and then a, an asterisk or something like that. So uh, a very simple regex is also vulnerable as well. So if you wrote something as simple as that, any kind of input like a exclamation mark um, would get it to halt. 
uh, and it doesn't have to be like 60,000 characters, it can be as much as like 16, 17, or 20 characters. So even if you're trying, like, trying to limit that, um, most cases it won't help unless you're actually limiting to like four characters or something like that. So I'm talking about regular expressions here for a while because it's an important topic and uh, it's been affecting a lot of modules that we have triaged in the Node Security Working Group. As you can see, all of these modules, maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't, uh, MS, Moment, very popular modules around front-end and back-end as well, uh, with almost 100 million downloads a month. That's crazy. Um, some best practices how to, how to overcome it. So first thing is you can write this paper. I know uh, you can read this paper, I'm sorry. I know that you're not going to read it. So I have some other best practices for you. Best practice number one, do not write your own regex. Great. Best practice number two, it's my favorite. Do not write your own regex. Uh, best practice number three, you can try using something like uh, validator, which is if you need, for example, to validate IP addresses, base64 characters, whatever, you can try and use it. Uh, it doesn't mean that this is like completely safe. If you've actually gone back and seen uh, some kind of uh, like advisory, security advisories around validator, it has been known to have uh, re uh, redos uh, vulnerabilities as well. But at the very least, you know, you're not writing something that you have a little bit of experience on and probably they know and look at it uh, a lot more uh, 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 in, in, uh, in a lot more uh, times than, than you are doing uh, for your own code, maybe. Um, best practice number four is you can use something that's called safe regex. It's a node model that you can give it uh, just a regex. It will apply some kind of heuristics around it and figure out if it's something that's safe to use or not. Hopefully, you're not going to get regular expressions as user input because that's really, really, really bad. Uh, but in case you need to just uh, evaluate your own, there's this, which is a very quick uh, way to do it. Uh, this, is, uh, this has been done, uh, created by uh, uh, Jamie Davis, who is also a PhD uh, around um, and has done some uh, papers, research papers um, around uh, the problem of regular expression denial of service attack throughout many ecosystems. He also wrote something else uh, that you can use in CI if you are interested. Just talk to me later, I'll be happy to tell you about it. If you are using, uh, if you have project managers, you know, who are telling you security is not important, so you can read this book, How to Ignore Security and Deliver Your Project Really Fast. So silver linings in Node. Let's, let's talk about some silver linings. So the NPM JS ecosystem, what's going on there? What are we doing to, to, to kind of secure the system? So one thing is fighting those typo squatting attacks that I showed you at the beginning with, uh, sorry, not with, uh, with CrossEnv and other kind of uh, uh, packages that were uh, um, you know, not immune to that problem that were having uh, typo squatted uh, packages around them. So first of all, we have uh, historically two packages called JSON stream. They are the exact same characters, except some are uppercase, some are lowercase but it's the exact same uh, string altogether. Uh, and we can't remove them from the ecosystem because if we remove one of them, it would break the ecosystem. So this is like the only exception or like one of the only exceptions where we can't really, uh, you know, retroactively fix this. Uh, but what we can do is if someone is, you know, there's a React Native uh, kind of um, package, and what I want to do is create a malicious one, a malicious one called React Native, or react native like that, or react native like this, to try and trick someone and it will delete your hard drive, or do some more malicious stuff around it, that won't work. Because NPM, when you try to publish it, is going to tell you um, that you know, it's, it's going to strip out all the characters between what you're trying to create and what exists on the registry. And if, something, uh, if there's a match, it's, it's not going to let you do it. Um, the alternative is either pick a very different name to not typo squat it, or use namespaces, which is, in my opinion, a better way to also convey who is actually owning this, and you know, not just you know, React Native or whatever other example. The other thing that we've seen is if you are publishing uh, NPM packages, you probably have seen that when you do publish them, you get this notification. Why did it happen? Because basically, compromised accounts, you know, will get compromised, and people. Uh, published packages uh, in, in the name of the original author, and he didn't know about it. So one of the things that NPM had done before is create uh, NPM packet notification. So every time you push something, you're going to get this email. So if you have published something, uh, so sorry, if you hadn't published anything uh, for sure, and you're getting this, be alerted. The other thing is two-factor authentication, which again, we've seen that before uh, uh, in the previous talk, uh, talking about passwordless and stuff like that. I can't really... Um, um, you know, uh, say how much this uh, this is important. Okay, this two-factor authentication is is considerably uh, important, um, significantly important into what's been going on with NPM weak credentials. The research that I've shown you before, 
um, it's been it's been out there for like years, okay, like almost two years or something like that, uh, since 551, which is, has been there for a while. Uh, Adam uh, from the NPM uh, uh, team said, you know, the amount of people enabling that is 7.1, which is very low, very sad. So if you are using it, if you are a maintainer or you know people that are, please make sure that they are using. Um, uh, uh, two-factor authentication on their accounts. Let's talk about taking ownership of your app security, right? We're building applications, our own applications, not just libraries. How do we know if, uh, if they have vulnerabilities? So um, in, a, in a research that I've actually done uh, and released a couple of uh, weeks ago, I've asked developers and maintainers, you know, who is responsible for security? And as, they, um, as, as the respondents, uh, they said, you know, the majority of them, the vast majority of them, 81% said that developers are actually in charge or responsible for their app security, which is amazing. This is great. This, is mean, this means that as, may, as developers, we are understanding that this is an important topic uh, for us to handle. So one thing that you can do is, um, you know, you can, you can scan and, you know, audit for your uh, dependencies, uh, find them through, uh, uh, if you, you can use SNCC, uh, it's simple as, you know, installing it, authenticating it with an account and, you know, just testing it. Uh, the thing is, it, it's not, it doesn't go, gonna stop there. It's gonna, uh, the CLI tool is gonna tell you where it's coming from. So as being very friendly for developers, it's gonna tell you that uh, a vulnerability is actually introduced through several layers of nested dependencies so you know what you can do. And it's gonna tell you how you can fix that. So whether you're able to just rebuild, just run npm install, get newer, uh, newer packages, or maybe you need to upgrade them, or maybe Snake has a way to also give you patches. So even if there's no fix, uh, we may be able to give you a patch to fix that for you. Another way that uh, we kind of try to make that uh, easier for developers and more friendly is integrating as, as fast as we can, so kind of shifting security to the left, meaning let's go in and as you add you know, your Travis tests, your uh, code coverage, whatever you're adding there as, as, as tests for your CI as you push code, an open pull request, you're gonna have kind of a security audit that's gonna catch and see, well, maybe a new developer introduced some kind of library, some kind of framework that you're gonna use as a dependency in your app and we're gonna scan it. If it has no vulnerabilities, we'll break the, uh, we'll, we'll break the, the build so that you won't be able to introduce it. Um, the other thing that Sneak is able to do is gonna uh, be able to PR, so automatically pull request uh, things into your uh, into your code. So let's say you're having your your app deployed somewhere, and you know two two weeks later or whatever, um, your app you know th there's a new vulnerability. You don't need to scan it manually through some through some tool. We are scanning that for you uh, on a very uh, uh, regular. Uh, uh, routine and as we find a way to remediate the problem, for example, by upgrading one of those, we will upgrade and we will not just upgrade to the next major version. We're gonna say, uh, take a look and see if there's like a smaller, uh, uh, minimal path for uh, a server range that's gonna be able to uh, upgrade the library so we don't uh, necessarily break an API or something like that. If we will not be able to do that, of course, we will PR it and we will tell you this includes a breaking change. Um, the other thing is, as I was saying before, you know, maybe for an app you might be, uh, you know, using it in production or you know anywhere else, just a, le just a legacy app, for example, uh, that you scan. It has no vulnerabilities, but it doesn't mean that tomorrow or again in two weeks' time a vulnerability will not appear. So as you, as we find out about it, we will tell you, and there's like a UI you can see it, etc. So just monitor your vulnerabilities. That's kind of the end of uh, that talk. So the last thing that I want to go into is what I've been doing and what's been happening on the Node ecosystem in regards to security. So NP, uh, Node, the Node Foundation itself is kind of structured into, well, it just got merged into the, the JavaScript Foundation, into an open foundation in general, but uh, just like two weeks before that, uh, and st still right now as everything is getting um, uh, created and, and merged together. Uh, we still have a technical steering committee, a community committee, um, and several working groups who are able to drive important agendas throughout the node uh, uh, ecosystem itself. So one of those things is the, is the security working group. What we're doing is we're meeting every one month. Uh, there's an agenda. Uh, we, we, we go on a call for uh, one hour, um, talk about some things that we want to, to promote. And you know, everyone, it's both streamed live uh, as well as open, so everyone can ask questions and take part of it. Some of the scope of what of, uh, the security working group is doing is around improving the state of the node ecosystem. How is it doing that is through policies, through uh, an incident response team, which is uh, where I'm also active on and you know continuously uh, 
uh, triaging uh, reports uh, that you're probably, uh, as you are using NPM packages, uh, you know, as we are doing the work behind the scenes, so you may not heard about it too much, uh, but if you are using uh, security uh, scanning tools and stuff like that, you would see those kind of patches and vulnerabilities, advisories as they come in. Those things are, are you know, good chance to that these things came through the, the, the node security working group. Um, so if you are interested in a little bit more about that, there's a responsible disclosure policy on, the, on Hacker One, which is uh, the platform that we use to triage and work with maintainers as well as security researcher uh, uh, around uh, these vulnerabilities and you know, find a fix, make sure that there is a fix out um, for enough time so people can upgrade their dependencies and then we uh, let uh, the ecosystem know and issue a CV, etc. Uh, one of those things uh, means that we have to do it in a discreet way and kind of approach maintainers. Um, uh, you know, as we approach them, they may think, you know, who is this? Uh, who are those people? It may look uh, intimidating. Um, so we have to do this work of, you know, facilitating the communication, triaging the report itself so that there's no false positives, which can also happen a lot around CVEs. And um, very lastly, you know, there is a, a public vulnerability database that is open there and everyone can consume it. So part of uh, those uh, uh, CVEs or uh, reports that we're doing, uh, that we're creating, are being consumed by tooling that you might be using. Um, some examples of, uh, of reports that we triaged in the working group are Base64 URL, which has 2 million downloads, uh, React SVG for an XSS injection, uh, Path Reversal in Serve, which is a popular one that's used by uh, the ZIT project, uh, Redos in protobuf.js, which is you know almost 10 million downloads a month. Uh, so there, there's a lot of uh, of vulnerabilities and, and you know security that we're doing uh, around uh, the ecosystem that you know you might have not heard of, uh, but we're still uh, trying to you know get get everything more secure. Uh, the last thing is we actually created um, a bug bounty for Node.js. So if security researchers want to report something that's not related to uh, the ecosystem itself, but actually to Node Core, so there's a, uh, we're using uh, IBB, which is uh, the Internet Bug Bounty uh, pro uh, program, that's able to reward uh, security researchers uh, with an actual um, you know, monetary um, recognition. So we're able to, to do that for Node.js Core. And I want to end and say uh, at this point, thank you everyone for, uh, for being here. You know, open, open source is awesome. Use it responsibly. Uh, and if you have any questions around open source security, around uh, um, uh, you know, security in general, Node.js in general, I'm here to talk to you. So thank you so much.